Hello, in this video we're going to look at some of the commoner and more interesting congenital heart defects. But we're going to start off just making some very general comments about this group of defects as a whole. They are typified by the presence of abnormal or absent structures within the heart. And when we're talking about abnormal or absent structures, we could be talking about abnormal or absent uh, septa whether that be in the atria or the ventricles, abnormal or absent chambers within the heart, and abnormal or absent vessels. So it could be any or all of these could be present within um, a, a, a heart affected by a congenital heart defect. Their causes are various. However, they fall under three major categories. They can be caused by uh, genetic factors, as so many other developmental disorders can be caused. They can be caused by environmental factors. And when we're thinking about environmental factors, typically we're thinking about the presence of either toxins within the environment or drugs that the mother could have been taking. And finally, their causes can be idiopathic. And many, many of these uh, heart defects and many other embryological defects, no cause can be identified. And in that case, we would call that an idiopathic cause, no identified cause. Heart defects are the most common birth defects seen in around 1% of births. However, in the modern day and age, around 90% survive into adulthood. Only about 50 years ago, this number was far less favourable and many, many children died. What the consequence of this is, the fact that so many of these children survive into adulthood, is that there are lots and lots of adults living with congenital heart defects. And it's estimated something of the order of about 150,000 adults are living in this country with congenital heart defects. This has important implications. Consider, for example, a woman with a congenital heart defect who then wants to have a child. If she has any kind of cardiovascular compromise, that will mean that she needs very specialist care in order to go through with a successful pregnancy. So there are important clinical implications um, for the fact that so many adults are living with congenital heart defects. What we're now going to do is just consider three. Okay, three of the more interesting congenital heart defects one of which we have encountered once before, and two of which we should be able to work out what's going on based upon the embryology that we have already studied. Looking at the image on the top left-hand side, the first congenital heart defect we're going to consider is patent ductus arteriosus, which we can abbreviate as PDA, patent ductus arteriosus. As we said in previous videos, following birth, the various right to left shunts present in the fetus close. And um, an important one that needs to close is the ductus arteriosus visible here. If the ductus arteriosus fails to close in a child, then this can mean that there is excessive mixing of blood from the pulmonary and systemic circuits, which can lead to uh, problems for the child. So children can be born with patent ductus arteriosus and if it fails to close and causes problems for the child it may well need to be repaired. So patent ductus arteriosus very very important. However as we shall see when we look at um, the next case there are certain occasions where we might, might want to keep the ductus arteriosus open. The second congenital heart defect I want you to consider is so-called transposition of the great arteries. So this is transposition. And if we think about that word, transposition, trans kind of means swapping, swapping position. And in transposition of the great arteries, 
Instead of the pulmonary trunk coming from the right ventricle and the aorta coming from the left ventricle, they are swapped. So look at this image and we can see here is the aorta, in fact, coming from the right ventricle, whilst the pulmonary trunk is coming from the left ventricle. And this is a very, very dangerous situation indeed. Transposition is thought to be caused by a problem with the spiral septum that forms in the outflow tract coming from the common ventricle. You can, I think of it essentially as the spiral septum adding an extra 180 degrees to its twist, resulting in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta becoming swapped. It may be that defects in neural crest cell development contribute to this because we know that neural crest cells do make a big contribution to the formation of the spiral septum. Regardless of the mechanism, as I said, this is a dangerous, dangerous condition for the um, newborn child. And that is because instead of the pulmonary and systemic circuits crossing over like this, so I'm just using this figure of eight to show that they cross over so that oxygen um, can get from the pulmonary circuit to the body. Instead, what we have in transposition is that the pulmonary and systemic circuits are running completely independently of one another. So blood in the pulmonary circuit um, becomes more and more oxygenated. Blood in the systemic circuit will become less and less oxygenated because they don't cross over. Now, whilst the fetus <clears throat> is um, in utero, transposition shouldn't be too much of a problem due to the presence of the various shunts, okay? So the various shunts, for example, the shunt um, through the foramen ovale and the shunt through the ductus arteriosus enable some mixing of blood across the two circuits. However, the dangerous time for these children is after birth. Following birth, as you should recall, foramen ovale will close and the ductus arteriosus will close as well. And if those processes are allowed to happen, particularly closure of the ductus arteriosus, then what can happen is that we get this situation where the two circuits are running completely separately and the child will die very, very rapidly. So in this case, before a repair is conducted, what you can do is you can use um, pharmacological agents to maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus, keeping it open and enabling some mixing of blood in the separate pulmonary and systemic circuits. So transposition is um, a very um, informative condition um, which, which enables us to learn a lot about these right to left shunts. The final condition I want to discuss is, is almost like the archetypal um, congenital heart defect, and this is the tetralogy of fallow. So the tetralogy of fallow. Fallow being um, an anatomist, so this is a name. And tetralogy referring to the fact that there are four major um problems associated with this condition. Tetralogy of fallow, um, as I said, has a number of individual components, but really you can conceptualise it as, a, once again, a problem with the spiral septum. And in this case, it's not the fact that the spiral septum has undergone um, too many rotations. In this case, we can think about tetralogy as being caused by the spiral septum forming um, two eccentric vessels. So remember that the spiral septum, and I'm just in a cross section through the truncus arteriosus here, remember that the spiral septum splits the truncus arteriosus into two approximately equal halves, one becoming the pulmonary trunk and one becoming the aorta. Now, in tetralogy of fallow, what actually happens is that this split is eccentric. And in tetralogy, in fact, the aorta takes up a much bigger portion of the truncus, whilst the pulmonary trunk takes up only a very small portion. And this has a number of important knock-on consequences. The first 
consequence um, is that we have in Tetralogy of Fallow a so-called overriding aorta. OK, and it's, it's highlighted here um, in this figure where it's been stated that the aorta is shifted to the right and overrides. So the aorta overrides across the ventricular septum to sit over the right ventricle. So the aorta has taken up too much of the truncus arteriosus. The knock-on effect of that, the reciprocal effect of that, is that if your aorta is too big and has taken up too much space within the truncus, the pulmonary trunk becomes too small. So the second um, component is that we have pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so we have obstruction of the right ventricular outflow due to the fact that not enough of the truncus arteriosus was given to the pulmonary trunk. So we've got an overriding aorta and we've got um, blockage stenosis of the outflow from the right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis. As a consequence of this pulmonary stenosis, of course, the right ventricle will have to work much harder in order to get blood out into the pulmonary trunk because it's got to push against a narrowed outflow. And what we consequently see there is right ventricular hypertrophy where the right ventricle gets bigger, more muscular because it's trying to push blood through this narrowed outflow. Finally, to go back to our diagrams on the left-hand side, normally... The spiral septum, we said the spiral septum will normally fuse to the endocardial cushions, thus enabling us to have complete septation of the heart. However, if you imagine the case in tetralogy, where, as we said, the spiral septum is eccentric, meaning that more of the truncus arteriosus is devoted to the aorta, in this case, if you like, the free edge of the spiral septum won't line up with the endocardial cushions meaning that we end up with a ventricular septal defect, okay? So the fourth feature in the tetralogy is that we have a ventricular septal defect whereby the ventricular septum has not formed properly. And this is down to the spiral septum effectively not lining up properly with the endocardial cushions. So that's all I've got to say about congenital heart defects. Um, these are very important conditions Thank you very much for listening.